Welcome to the Daily Thinker Podcast. If this is your first time here, this podcast is here to encourage and inspire people to think about sports, theology, and apologetics all in one show. There is no other podcast or YouTube channel out there that's doing what we're doing. I repeat, there's no other podcast or YouTube channel out there doing what we're doing here at The Daily Thinker. But we have a special guest today that goes by the name of Brio Williams. She is an awesome woman of god she does a lot of things she's a speech language pathologist she is a youtuber a blogger and a number of other things that she has done but anyway enough of this talking man let's just hop straight into the show i'm so excited for this episode man but first of all we got to drop that intro before we get into it Tell us about this name thing. Like some people call you Bria, some people call you Bria. I really want to know what's going on. So I prefer to go by Bria Williams. My real name is Bria Williams. But you know, I went to a predominantly white school. And since my last name was Williams, I was always at the end of the list. And the teacher was always like, I'm gonna need help with this one. Last name Williams, can you pronounce it for me? I was like, you know what? Just call me Bria. It's okay. And my family members call me Bree, so it really just depends on whatever you want to call me, honestly. Okay, so, oh, that's how you got the name. You went to this, oh, you went to the white school. And they, oh, they couldn't understand your name. I pro, I got, I get the same thing every time, because my name is and They be like, a, a what? I be like, just call me Gus for short. I mean, every single time. I get that. Exactly. I'm like, you know what? Don't even worry about it. It's, it's cool. It's cool. But <laughs> let's um jump into how you got here. Like, how did you get into like this kingdom building is speaking like putting down a word of god just like a strong woman of god you i know you can't grow up like like i mean i know you just ain't come out the womb like that even even like to i want to re- rewind something right quick even yeah. before you got out the womb i mean it's a crazy testimony i think that people need to hear it i don't want to yeah. talk much about it i cuz i want you to tell me a little bit more cuz i'm curious to know yeah. about that. So, um, so this is how it went down. So I was raised in a church. I was raised in an apostolic church. And um, I don't know if you know about the apostolic doctrine, but uh, the doctrine believes in being baptized in Jesus' name and then receiving um, the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. So it was a very uh, charismatic, holiness-based church, right? So I was there my whole life. I was 18 years old. And... <laughs> I was about to go to Old Miss for college. At this point, I had been going to church every Sunday, almost every Wednesday, simply because that's what my parents did. So when I got to Old Miss, I was like, ooh, thank you, Jesus. I'm about to be free. I don't got to go to church every Sunday or nothing like that. So I know for most people, when you're raised in a church, even if you're not really living that lifestyle, it was seed planting, right? So when I got to Old Miss my freshman year, I mean, I wasn't really going to church like that, but I also wasn't living no worldly lifestyle either, simply because I just wasn't interested in it. So fast forward, I started dating this guy, and he was a part of our church. And back then, it was like, you shouldn't date nobody that's not saved because y'all unequally yoked, even though y'all both Christians, right? <laughs> so in my mind, I was like, oh, here we go. So I decided to get saved, which was I had already been baptized. Now it was time for me to speak in tongues, basically. So I received the gift of the Holy Spirit. I received the gift of speaking in tongues, but there was no heart change. Oh. Since the next year, I went to Ole Miss, and your girl was wild and out. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. I, mean, I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I was partying. I was drinking. And this is when Jesus became real to me. So towards the end of my sophomore year, I was really getting into the partying and drinking thing, and I hated both. I never liked to party or to drink. I was just doing it because that's what I was around. And so in the middle of those nights of getting drunk, God would literally speak to me and be like, Bria, this is not what I have for you. This is not what I called you to. I have more for you. Now, I'm somebody that's not really reading the word. I'm not really praying, but I can hear God clearly. Wow. And so once he started speaking to me like that, every night I prayed three sentences. Dear Lord, please give me a heart for you. Please give me a desire for you. Please help me. I did not. That's all I knew to pray. Um, and so, but I was still going out, getting drunk and stuff. It was my 20th birthday. And I was hanging with my super worldly friends. Love them, but they was worldly. And I got super drunk. And the next day I woke up sick. 
Wow. Do do you remember that night from you being drunk? Do you remember anything from that night? I remember that night. Like, I remember being aware, but not being aware. You know that, that Mr. Krabs meme where it's like he in a whirlwind? Yeah. That's how that was, I felt. Okay, that was you. Yeah. And so the next day, like, I drove home in complete silence. It was like a two-hour drive, complete silence. In that car ride, I was like, I'm done. Like, I had come to the absolute end of myself. And that very day, I went to a Christian Lifeway store, and I got some Christian books. Okay. And I just started reading. Yeah, I started reading. I started feasting on the Word of God. And that's literally when my life changed. Like, you remember the books that you got? What books did you read? Like, you remember the books I you rem- picked up? I, rem- I could remember all of them, but there was one. It was this book called Yada Yada Prayer Club. I know. I mean, that's a weird name, but okay. 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 Weird name, though, but I guess it was a good book. It was called Yada Yada Prayer Club, and I remember praying to God because I didn't know where to start. I was literally by myself and walking with the Lord. I was like, and I didn't even pray this to God. I was just like, I just wonder where I can find out about the life of Jesus. Like, how do I know what he did? And then one day, I literally just woke up out of nowhere, and I opened my Bible to the gospel. Uh, which which book? I believe it was Mark. Mark. Okay. Wow. Somebody finally has something besides John. Everybody say John all the time. Right. I open the right. gospel of John every single time. People, Everybody love the gospel right. of John. Exactly. It was Mark, and I believe after that, I read Matthew, and I was shook. And that's when it started. Yeah, it sounds something similar to me, too. I was shook after I read Matthew. Um, I think I forgot what Jesus, Jesus said. Whoever looks at a woman with lust commits adultery in his, in his heart. I said, oh, OK, so they pinned me to the wall right there. I said, oh, well, I guess I need you. I can't do this on my own. And so, man, yeah, I, I, I love that. that. It's crazy that this, this happens in college a lot to people. But a lot of people walk away from the faith in college, too. Like, exactly. So it's very true. It's kind of it's backwards. Very true. It's kind of backwards to like get so called saved in college. I know. And I honestly feel like it's a miracle though, because you know, college life is so many different things that can distract you. Like, I have younger sisters that are in college and they are struggling. Like, they have to wake up and make a decision every day Am I going to live for God or am I going to be like the world? So, college is like that transition phase, though. Yeah. So we're okay. Talking about that, like what what was that shift? Like that shift in your mind. You was like, okay, well, I'm gonna give this up. And how was that shift? Was that shift hard or was it like just easy? Like just, okay, I'm just gonna let go. Yeah. I'm telling you when you get tired of yourself, like when you get tired of you, it's easy for you to do. Well, for me, it was easy for me to do a 360 because I didn't want to keep living the way that I was living because I was living in darkness. There was no joy in what I was doing. There was no purpose in what I was doing. It just felt like I was here every day. So when I say I made a complete 360, like people came up to me and they were like, if God can do it for you, I know he can do it for me. Like it was that type of thing. And this is song by Elevation Worship called Oh, Come to the Altar. You ever heard of it? Yeah, I know that song. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I got tired of that song. I think in 2017, I'm like, oh, my goodness, when are they going to cut this song off, man? Right, but it's the part where it says, are you tired of yourself or have you come to the end of the road? That's where I was. Like, when you have no other choice but to make a decision to either stay helpless or turn to hope, you just got to make the right decision. Right, got to make that right decision. But being young, it's so hard to make that right decision, man. Because when we it's young, true. we like, man, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm young. You know, my friend's doing this, so I'm going to do this, too. And then you get looked it, at as the eyeball. Did you get looked at as the eyeball, like the the weirdo? Like, oh, she changed. She thinks she better. Yeah. Um, I didn't care. And so I didn't notice, honestly. Like, mm. I simply did not care how nobody felt about what I was doing or what I had to say because I knew it was right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying. See, folks, man, that's just that's amazing. Yeah, I didn't think anything like that. And another thing, I'll say this, because I was cool with so many people beforehand, when I did my switch, a lot of people actually respected it. Mm. And they kind of wanted it for themselves. Right. Yeah. But sometimes you still get those little group of haters who be like, man, why is she yeah. doing it? Or those who try to pull you back into their life. Oh, 
I now, did not play no type of games. Okay, so how did you I, react to that? I felt disrespected when people did that to me. I, when my friends tried to pull me back into the world, I felt disrespected. So to me, it opened my eyes to the type of friends that they were, which told me that they didn't respect the lifestyle change that I had made. And I just had no, I didn't have the time for it. Like, I always tell young people or I always try to show them, like, you have to be bold in the decisions that you make, especially if you make a decision for God. Like, you have to be bold in it because the enemy is going to use anything and everyone to, to try to get you distracted. So when people try to, like, turn me the other way, I was like, no, ma'am, Pam, we're not friends no more. Right. That's a, hey, that's when you grow up and be like, you know what? I'm putting my foot down. You know, I'm going to live for Christ and I'm not trying to do nothing else. Exactly. I'm about to get my laptop charger, so I'm just gonna take it with me. Okay, cool. That's that's fine. We don't, we don't got no problem with it. But you said something so important though. When you was like, okay, even though people see that I'm, even though people might look down on me, like because I'm doing this, I didn't even notice. Yeah. And that was like so powerful um, to me, like because you in this relationship. That's just like when you in a relationship with anybody. You don't notice exactly. nobody else around you try to like talk to you or whatever. I mean, you might notice if they be in your DMs, but hey, you you know what I'm saying? Like you don't notice it. So that was powerful that you said that. I never thought of that like that. It's it's kind of crazy. You want to know why you get that mindset? It's because you know that the person you're dealing with is worthy. Like you won't cheat on your girlfriend in a relationship because you know she's worth you being faithful to. That's how I view God and Jesus. He's worthy of my faithfulness. He's worthy of me staying consistent to him and not choosing darkness. So it was easy. Wow. That's ooh, that's amazing. You even got like a another like testimony about mm-hmm. even how you got to this earth. Like oh, it's it's that's crazy too. Yeah. Um it's real crazy. Uh, so I really wasn't supposed to be here. Because my mom got pregnant with me when she was 22. She wasn't married, and she wasn't trying to get pregnant. So she had actually made an appointment um, to get an abortion. And um, right before she, no, when she made the appointment for the abortion, they were like, oh, actually, we're sorry, ma'am. You're actually too early for us to give you an abortion, which doesn't make sense because the earlier, the better, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So my mm-hmm. mom's like, okay, you can just move it to a later date. So I can't remember the exact date that she was planning to get me aborted, but my grandma had a dream. And in my grandma's dream, there was a little baby girl, and she was like, Grandma, please don't let her kill me. Wow. And my mama told my grandma told my mama that dream, and she canceled the appointment. Wow. So I guess God spoke in a vision or a dream. Mm-hmm. And that's how and he works so, sometimes. Yeah, and I'm like, I that just shows me that we all have a calling over our life and we all have purpose over our life. And it don't matter what age you are, the enemy will try to attack you and get you out of the way. When he knows that you're going to bring glory to God, you've got to know that it's going to be some type of opposition coming your way. So. Right, every time it's going to be a battle. They're just like the battle we're fighting with right now. This, it, right. It, this COVID. Day. That's one pandemic, and we got the other pandemic. This this right the racist the racism pandemic the the systemic racism. That's exactly. a huge pandemic, and you put on a wonderful, a wonderful protest in the city Thank of Madison, you. Mississippi, and that's yes. surprising. A black woman in Madison, Mississippi, holding a protest. I, I was kind of shocked. I was like, oh, she ain't gonna come to Jackson. I thought I thought everybody just all the black folks come to Jackson and just do it. What happened was, okay, so our very first protest was in Jackson. So May 31st, wow. we had very first peaceful protest. It was at the governor's mansion, and then we walked to the police department. And the next day, Tate Reeves got on live or whatever he, wherever he gets. And he was like, we respect um, how the protest went. We respect that everything was done in peace. Now, we are currently in the process of planning our event in Madison. It's not going to be a protest. It's actually going to be a night of prayer, repentance, and worship Ooh. centered around yeah, centered around racial reconciliation. Um, so I don't have the dates for everything. We're still waiting to get approved. So y'all can be praying for us. We have been in contact with the mayor of Madison as well as Tay Reeves, and we're just hoping that they approve us for this event. 
Oh, uh, that's amazing. So what you got to say to people who think people who put on protests are just crazy? They don't got no sense. They just want to break stuff. Like, I guess people don't know. It takes a lot into getting this stuff together, getting the protest together. And so, please, man, just explain to these people and let them know so they can just stop talking and say they need. Yeah. So, like, okay, so I'm a Christian. So, of course, I'm going to come from my Christian standpoint. So, people don't, they don't want to realize because it's very obvious, but Jesus protested. Protesting means you fight against something that's unjust or you fight against something that's not fair. Jesus did that literally all the time. He advocated for the people that were being oppressed. He advocated for the poor. He advocated for people that other folks were trying to shame. Like those were the exact people that he spoke up for. That's what protesting means. We're just speaking up for a group of people that are being oppressed. And so if people think that protesting is evil and unjust, then they don't read the Bible. And it's just facts. And another thing that I have to say towards that is whoever is putting on the protest the motive should always be pure. The motive should always to bring us together, not to divide us or cause any division or hate. And so when we put on our first protest, like we planned our protest in 30 minutes. We put the flyer out for the protest at seven o'clock before the night before. And then the next day, like 150 people show up. Mm. And it's not because of who we were. It's simply because this is something that God wants for his people to do. Like, yeah. this is the church coming together to advocate. Um, so, I all, like, the people I've been talking to since the protest, I always let them know, your motive behind why you want to have a protest is going to show how successful your protest will be. Like, if you want to do hate, have riots, do looting and all that type of stuff, it won't be successful and it won't be respected. So. Right. So with the riot and the looting, how you feel about that? Um, I this is how I feel about it. So I understand the feeling that that comes from. They're angry. We all angry. Right. People are upset. They are frustrated. They are tired. We tired. Take away the art. <laughs> that's how black people feel. So that's the emotion that they feel. And sometimes when people feel angry. They don't. They not trying to be peaceful. <laughs> they nope. not trying not at to all. have no or trying to come together. They trying to make noise. Like they trying to show you that they are tired. I do not agree with rioting or looting because I feel like that takes from other people that may not even have done anything. Um, but I do agree with the emotion that's still behind it. Right, and that's what man. So many Christians be like, man, they, these folks going to hell. Who out here rioting? Who out here? Just protesting all these, but I'm like, man, did, do y'all not know what they was about to kill John? And they said, don't kill him unless the folks were will riot. They gonna riot if we if y'all kill John because they said John is a prophet. And so exactly. people tired of black people getting killed unarmed. By the way, like unarmed, you got skittles, drinks, you walking. I mean, you already handcuffed. What else? I mean, what more do you want somebody to do? Just continue exactly. to take, just continue to just get beaten and beaten and beaten and just take it. Nah, that's not going to happen. And so to me, like when people say things like we don't understand Black Lives Movement, we don't understand why you want to do all these rallies and protests and stuff like that. That shows me that you want us to stay silent in our oppression because you feel like you have the upper hand. Mm. I don't do well with that. And plenty of other black people don't do well with that because the question is, you're only the majority by number, but you're not superior. They have a lot of people that are not of color have the major the superior mindset, which makes them feel like they can do what they want to do. They can say what they want to say. And if you question it, then you're out of line. And right. that's not how America or the four founders or any of our laws state. However, that's how they do it. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I get what you're saying. That is how they judge. They look at themselves, hey, we got the most people, we the most superior race, and it's just really crazy. And we still dealing with this in 2020. And even just what happened this past Saturday with the other young man that got shot. I mean, people still getting like that's what I want to uh, like people still getting beat at protests. Like, what do we do about this? That's honestly a good question. So the first thing that I say is like, it's so important for us to get our government officials involved. Like, how how can you say that you're for the people when you're not fighting for the people, right? 
So that's why we went to the governor's mansion. Tate Reeves, we need you to make some noise. We need to know your motives and your heart. Like, attack your governor's, not attack, but make them make noise. Go to your mayors, go to your governors, learn their heart behind this. Get them to speak up because you're not just the mayor and the governor of the majority race, right? right. Your states don't just hold majority races. So you have to take a stand for everyone in your state. If they don't, if if our laws are not changed, ain't nothing gonna change. That's true. We could talk all day long, but if the laws don't change, we're not gonna see nothing. Right, and the reason to me, I think the laws might not never change because everybody who's claimed to be a believer thinks that believers shouldn't do law, they shouldn't do entertainment. They shouldn't do nothing. They think everything is just worldly. Like you shouldn't be a part of that. Just be a part of the church. And to me, that's just a bad idea. And I think this happened in the 1920s, um, the fundamentalist movement. And they said, you know what? We can't answer Charles Darwin. So just if you in school, teach, you know, all of that, just leave all this stuff for the people in the world. And so but now see, we got lawyers. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. It's not even biblical, though. Right. Because. Why in Isaiah would they say that um, we will obey Jesus's government if the government doesn't exist for us to obey? So why would Jesus tell us to respect our authority if our authorities are authorities of the law? You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, how many times we try to pick and choose what we want to obey in the Bible and there's still ob- disobedience to God? Right. Like, it literally says in Joshua, obey all of these commands. Don't Don't stray. Like, Look at every single command and stay to course with those commands. Like you can't pick and choose what you want to obey. Right. And sometimes we know that this thing is right, but I sometimes I think people just don't know how to respond to it. Like, yeah, we know what we seen is unjust. Sometimes people just don't know how to respond. Yeah. Um. One thing I feel like is important though is for if you are a Christ follower, your whole life is supposed to be a life of action. Nothing about you should be passive because Jesus wasn't passive. And if he's who we who we're trying to be like, then we have to act accordingly. Um, whether that doesn't mean that you have to get on social media and just write all these statuses and stuff, but talk to a friend, pray for somebody, pray over somebody, go annoy somebody, do something, but don't just sit there and just twiddle your thumbs and talk to God about it. I can't remember who it was. In the Bible, I think maybe it was Moses. I'm not sure. But they kept praying to God. And God was like, why you keep coming to me and praying? Go do what I told you to do. Yeah. Like, be obedient. Yeah, just be obedient. So, listen and move. So how can we get people to move? That's the real. That's like, we need to get people to start moving. So, like, the only way to get people to move is for us to move ourselves. Like, the only way that people will want to do something is if they see somebody else doing it. Okay, like okay, can I, I can I steal that quote you just said? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to steal that quote. Okay, sorry to cut you off. <laughs> well, you're fine. But, like, when I was leading and organizing that protest, so many people showed up because people were just looking for an opportunity. That's all people need. People just need somebody to say yes, and that's it. So when you say yes, when I say yes, that empowers somebody else to say yes, and then you get more people involved. Um. Another thing that's going to get people to act is conviction. Like when the oh, yeah. Holy Spirit convicts, yes. it's not comfortable to say no. So um, conviction and then us also acting ourselves. Right. That's, what it's gonna take. that's true. We got to move ourselves, man, because we got the gospel. I mean, we got the truth. We got the answer to these things. Because I can't think of no other religion in the world that treats like humans all the same. Like Muslims, I mean, if you're not doing this or doing that, you second class. Women, second class. Atheism, right. Charles Darwin said the superior race should survive. Like all these other religions, Hinduism, all of these religions don't have the answer. We got the answer, but we got to move with these answers, man, for real. Exactly, exactly. Like, what's that song, Keys to the Streets or whatever? We literally got the keys. We just choosing not to open the door and do nothing. Right. Hey, I got to steal that quote too. So I thank you. If you want to just keep on giving me quotes to steal, you know, I, I would do it. I don't got no problem with doing that at all. That is fine with me. But we've been protesting for so long, though. So many years. Yeah. It seems like yeah. no change coming. Do you feel any change? I don't know. I feel like I feel a change. But I feel like I don't feel a change because I still see cops get shooting yeah. people at protests. And- 
Yeah. Why they're not I in protest? Like exactly, yeah, I feel exactly how you feel. I feel like this is what kind of bothers me about it. There's always waves of momentum, but it's never consistent. That's the issue. So, okay, we see Amaya Aubrey, we see Breonna Taylor, we see George Floyd. We all rally up. We got that momentum. We ready to fight. But then we get tired. Because we feel like ain't nobody doing nothing, so we stop. That's not how justice works. Uh, you remember that, start, that story in the Bible where this woman kept going to the judge every single day asking him for the same thing? Yeah, demanding yeah, justice. The only reason, yeah, and the only reason he gave it to her was because she was so consistent, not because he wanted to, but because she was annoying with it. Right. That's how you make noise. Like, even the Bible says, keep asking and you receive. Keep knocking and the door will be asked. Keep seeking and you will find. Like, we're not consistent. Yeah. We go in and then we stop. Then we go in again and then we stop. Yeah, what about the people who be trying to crush down there, um, or crush down there? They be like, okay, we've been batting for 400 years, so what are we going to do now? Okay, those were our ancestors battling for 400 years. What are we doing? Right. Like, what are we doing? Black people have been oppressed, yeah, and our ancestors, they stood up and they fought, but what are we doing? Right. They didn't just do that for us. Like, they didn't just do that for that moment. They passed the baton on to us to continue. And I told my parents this, like, my parents were born in the 70s. Their generation was real quiet. Mm -hmm. Like, their generation, I didn't see a whole lot of advocating, a whole lot of protesting or nothing. So it's falling on our generation now. And the millennials, we real, we don't, we don't play. We not here for the myth. We not here for the slander. We are very here for the culture. So that's why we see so much of us fighting and standing up because we don't let people play games with us. But we gotta let pe- we can't let people play games with us consistently. Right, and that's why I feel like we gotta. I, sometimes I feel like we gotta protest a different. I think we should show a protest like armed. I think that's. I feel like that's the right way to protest to get respect because I look at these other people who went to go to the Capitol. They had AK forty sevens on their shoulder. You know the police didn't do nothing. They respected them. So you know what? I guess we got to start carrying our weapons at these protests. But then I feel like if we carry weapons, it might be worse for us. Who knows? Oh, oh, definitely. <laughs> so are you saying that you see with like how the Black Panthers handle themselves? Oh yes, I yes, I would definitely like us to handle ourselves like the Black Panther did. I love it. We need to. I guess we got to be more like Huey Newton or something. I don't know at this point because it's out of it's control. A of, it's a whole lot of trial and error to be honest. So we still learning. I feel like yeah, I, yeah, we still learning. But I do feel like it's a change though, because like even at your protest, it's a lot of whites. Even at all the other protests across the globe. Berlin, London. I mean, it's a lot of white. This is my first time ever seeing this. Because somebody made it very clear. They was like, we in the middle of a pandemic on TV. You don't have no choice but to sit on social media and watch the news. When George Floyd died and how he died, there was no way for anybody to say that that wasn't a hate crime. You could literally see the police officer adjusting his knee to make it even worse and harder for him to breathe. You get what I'm saying? Uh People were outraged by how someone could hate someone that much to do it. And it was obviously because of race. And if somebody didn't feel, like I said, conviction causes people to move. So many people are moving because they they feel convicted to move. Yes. You will feel guilty if you just sat there and tried to deny what happened in the video. So right, that's true. That's a. I mean, even knee on your neck. That's like a MMA hole. I think MMA rounds like what three minutes, three minutes long. Literally, like you nine minutes. It's, I don't know how many rounds. Like I'm like three nine rounds. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. You handcuff. There's you're you're literally on the ground. So at our protest, we got on the ground. The hot ground on the road, face to face with with the street. That was the most uncomfortable, painful, unrealistic. It was terrible. It was completely uncomfortable. So he's on the street. He can't breathe. He's l- using his last breath to advocate for his life. Right. And I always say this. It's like a movie. It's like something you see on Netflix or something. Like you'd be like, oh, "Wow, he finna die." This 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 movie crazy. It was unbelievable. And that's what, oh my goodness. And that's what we're seeing. Have y'all been seeing any like fruit, any big benefits from doing this protest? 
Cause I, I, um, I, you just said y'all was up on up on the ground, face on the ground, laid out. Like, have y'all seen any benefits yet? I know it's it kind it's kind of early, but have y'all been seeing any yeah. type of benefits? I honestly have seen a lot of benefits. I've seen so many young people be like charged up to act. Like, and I met so many people. Like, when I tell you, I literally had about fifty people to reach out to me that week, and literally majority of everyone that reached out to me was white. And they were saying, please let me know when the next event will be. Please let me know if I can help donate anything to you guys. Like, there literally is a change. And let's let's state this. I have not heard any reports of any type of hate crimes or looting or rioting in Mississippi. Yeah. So whether we see anything in America, Mississippi is doing good. Yeah, we're doing good here in Mississippi, maybe because we so small. Hey, that's what I, I think that might be the reason. I think we was a big city like Atlanta. We probably saw some looting, but uh, uh, I guess we we so small. I guess people, I, well, no, everybody knows about Mississippi. I, I mean, I, I think we the right. second most racist state in the world. I put Alabama at number one. <laughs> that's just I my opinion. <laughs> now, this is, okay, so with the police going crazy, police, oh, my goodness. Like you said, mm-hmm. it seemed like the police not listening. And, you know, the Black Lives Matter organization, they talking about defunding police. So what do you think about defunding police? I, I'm not sure about defunding police. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. yeah, I don't necessarily agree with defunding police. What I do feel like needs to happen is um, you, the police department needs to give the citizens of the state um, more opportunity in decision making when it comes to who they choose or how they choose or more so how they train. Now, I know that this may not make a whole lot of sense, but I feel like we, the people need to see what y'all do in y'all's training because we need to know the policies that y'all are teaching because ain't no way in heck that it's okay or that y'all are training for people to kill. Right. That doesn't make sense. And my thing, I was thinking the other day, like, what's the hierarchy of the weapons that y'all use? Like, why isn't it going from least amount to kill somebody to the most thing that could kill somebody? It's like they go straight for the guns. Right. Where's the taste? Where's the, like, baton things? Like, what are the measurements here? Right. I feel like they uh-huh. know, but I feel like sometimes they just act up on impulse, you know, or they just act on hate. Sometimes I feel like they act on hate, too. It's true, but in my in my opinion, why are you a police officer? Right. You should be trained to that you're going to experience things like this. Like, I feel like that should be part of the training. Right. Like, is there a questionnaire for you guys to answer? Like, are you racist? Right. Do you have any hate towards any type of groups of people? You have a racist what background. Right. <laughs> right. Like, come on. Like, let's see. Why? It seems like anybody can be a police officer at this point. I feel like I might be a police officer tomorrow if I really wanted to. I think they'll take me. Hey, I ooh, I almost did something. It's uh, that it, how work? <laughs> That's how it is for police, man. You could just get hired, but they need to reform the police. They need to change the training and everything. How they hire people. They need to do. Sometimes I feel like, do y'all do background checks? Because this kind of crazy. And, and what's the repercussion? Right. Because that, oh yeah, get in yes, get into that. Because I cannot remember the officer's name that killed George Floyd, but there have been many accusations. Like, he had been reported many times for using, a, like, too much force and all that type of stuff, or even using hate towards other groups. Why he's still working? And why y'all still letting him go out and arrest people? Why? And then with that um, Rodney King. Right, Rodney King. It took heck alone for anything to happen to them officers and now some of them are like sergeants in command. Right. Like, That's the hypocrisy we see all the time. Exactly. And then I don't know if you watch that um what's that man? Dave Chappelle. You know, he yeah. called Did you Oh yeah, it? I haven't saw it yet. I I plan on watching. I need to watch it. So You got I need to watch it. It was so powerful. But he spoke on this black man because he was a police officer and he reported that his partner was using too much force, right? They went completely against him, and he ended up getting fired for trying to do something right. And so, what he ended up doing was going and killing all of those police officers, and then he ended up killing himself. Wow! And I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is so much!" But what even led to him feeling like he had to act that way 
was was that he stood up for justice and he tried to do something right, but because he was a black man, it was like, no, you're not gonna come against us and try to stir up stuff. Right, your word don't count. What is your word, really? You just here. Right. You you just here. Who you play? <laughs> right. Exactly. You a shield, basically. Exactly. Are you a shield to just go out there? Maybe you might get shot. Hey, who cares? That's how it is sometimes, though, which is um, outrageous. I mean, outrageous. I, it, just They got to find a different way to punish these police, like you said. Like, exactly. They, exactly. People need severe punishment. They're just like, with, man, I hate, to, I, I hate to bring this up. Like Emmett Till, when he got <laughs> killed, like murdered horribly. You learned this in like... I think I learned this in middle school. I want to say I like what? Yeah. I, I was so. I mean, I was shocked. I, I was. Exactly. I was shocked. And the woman, she came out and said that she lied. That he didn't do nothing. And she never got. She never got. She never went to prison. Never. What happened to her? And nothing at all. But see? you see, see, Bill Cosby. I'm not saying what Bill Cosby did was right. I don't know what he did, but no. but Bill Cosby got sent to prison ASAP, real quick. They didn't care how old he was. But you see, uh, this woman, she got a man. They butchered him, basically, which, and she gets to just walk. Exactly. And you want to know another thing? People losing their jobs not enough. Anybody can lose their job. Right. Like, stop. Like, put these people in jail. Like, they act like losing a job is, like, the worst thing that could happen to somebody. People can get another job. But once you send somebody to jail for doing something that was wrong, that stays on their record. You get what I'm saying? Right. And they gonna let be- them know how it feels to be black in America. Let right. them know how it feels to be locked up and have to try to build your life after you get out of jail. How about this? And this start, man. I feel like all this started with the Trayvon Martin incident, even though I know it's been going on for hundreds of years, even before Trayvon Martin. But when Trayvon Martin, I remember that I was in high school. And Trayvon, I remember watching, man, my my whole family, we were watching in the living room, watching, waiting on the verdict. So, you know, we everybody thinking that he finna be guilty. And, like, you know, we sitting there like, it's like a party. Like, we waiting for him. We waiting to get justice, everybody. Like, and then they said not guilty. And then after that, it just started to spiral out of control. You know, cops said, you know what? He, he got off. You know, I might get off, too, you, you know? Right. It was Trayvon Martin and then Mike Brown is when everybody was like, you know what? This is this is America. Right. This and it's and, right. And now George Floyd, which made everybody speak up. <sighs> which is kind of crazy. And I think the church has to be a moving force in this movement, man. We can't just sit back and not do nothing. Cause like I said, exactly. we got the answer. Like you said, we got the key. We gotta move. We gotta be able to move though. Right, we gotta be obedient to it. And if we don't move, we gonna continue to see what's going on in our country. If we don't move, we being disobedient. Right, just straight disobedient. It's it's simply just just like that, disobedient. Yeah. And so this issue, hmm, this makes me always think like when stuff like this happens and goes on, and us church folk, you know, we talk about this for a season. Yeah. And then when the season over, you know, we back to talking about whatever we want to talk about. And that got to stop. I mean, we can't just be waiting for stuff to happen to then address it. We got to address it. It's like it. we wait on stuff to happen, right? Like what you said, it's like people are, okay, let's wait till something. To, it's like we're expecting for something to happen, but we we should want it to end. You get what I'm saying? We yeah. shouldn't want to see no more of it. Right. And the only way to do that is, like you said, be obedient and move. And move in the direction that God wants you to move in. And I like how you brought up the church because this this is my soapbox. I've been thinking about this for the past two weeks. Let it out the here. Church, we're really not... I don't think that we are living up to the standard that God has for us. There is a lack of righteousness in the church. Like, overall... Because righteousness will tell you that you have to be bold. You have to see God as sacred. You have to see the church as sacred. Like, I don't know if people think this, but Jesus was not white. Jesus was not in the majority race. Right. And Jesus spoke up for all races. So not only do we need to ask white people to stop being racist, but us as minority groups as well, we got to stop being racist too. Because I know I hold a lot of racist 
seeds in my heart and I had to check it yeah. because yeah, I'm a black woman, but before that I'm a child of God and I'm a member of the church. Right. And righteousness is the standard. Not yes. this worldly stuff that we be doing, not this let's go worship, then leave and go back to live our reckless life. That's not how we supposed to live. So, Which is so true. We can't be living this double life. Especially double life when it comes to justice because I feel like justice is so important to God. I mean, he's a God. That's one of his attributes of justice. That's a big attribute of his. The words that he uses all the time is justice, righteousness, and he, he describes himself as having a government. Like, come on. Right, but so many times we try to just deny justice and live in that little bubble. And even though, even us black folks, we be living in bubbles too. I know sometimes we be like white folks live in bubbles, but we be living in bubbles. I was living in a bubble like when all this was going before everything went on. Because you know, subconsciously you like you care, but yeah. not you don't actively care. Now I'm just speaking for myself. I don't know about you, but. I know that's with me um, at times, even before everything, everything happened. Like, just going back to what um, you said, we got to move before stuff happened, man, especially the, as black people. And so what exactly. can we do to really move as black people in time like this? Um, sometimes I feel like we need to humble ourselves as a race. Because at a, at a certain point, we feel like we shouldn't have to be stuff because we've been oppressed for so long. Mm, actually... We as black people, when we come together, people actually tend to listen to us more right. because we actually have a lot of influence in the world. When every time you look around, people are trying to imitate our culture. Every time. Come on. So if you see all of us come together to rally for us to be uh, treated equally and for us to have justice and we don't pipe down and we don't get quiet and our momentum doesn't wear down, people have to listen. Um, and, and, and so I kind of think of this like the gospel. So you remember when Paul was talking, I believe this was in the Corinthians. He was like, um, there are false prophets that are proclaiming the gospel. Mm -hmm. Um, however, nonetheless, the gospel is being proclaimed, right? Right. So you have people like Joe Biden saying that you're not really trying, if you're not black, you, if you don't vote for me, you're not black. <laughs> I doubt that Joe Biden really cares <laughs> right. about how black people feel. But because black people come together and we have a voice and we make noise, he knows how important it is for us to be treated equally and to have justice. Right. So people hear us. And whether their motives in helping us is pure or impure, we're getting out there and our voices are being heard. True. But can we save this system? Should we say, should we? I know people be like, we can't save this system. I think we can save people from this wicked system, but we can't save people from system. Like, even that's even like with the police officers. I feel like police officers are so, I, I'm just so, man, I'm so indifferent about this. Like, they're good, but they're not good. Like, and he a good dude, but when he get in that system, it's going to mess him up. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, the question isn't like, can we change the system? I believe the the question is, do we really want the system to change? And right. if the system really was changed, will we accept it? I was praying the other day and God was like, if white people humble their, humbled themselves and apologized to y'all, would you be happy? And in my heart, I was like, no, because I have so much anger built up. That's kind of how we are right now. Like, even if things did change, I feel like we would still question it in a way. And we would it wouldn't just be something that we readily accepted. It would be more so like, mm, y'all owe us that change, so y'all better change. You get what I'm saying? So. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, we do got to. Oh, I yeah. feel like I feel like the system honestly can change. Right. Some for me, I feel like it. I feel like it can, but it can't. I don't know. I feel like we can't. We can't save the double system. I at, at some point because. Every wicked system is is ran by a wicked master, and that master is the devil himself. So I feel like I can't save the devil system, but I guess we can save people from that system and take right. them out or, of it. Or you can view it like, okay, it's somebody wicked running that system, but we proclaim the name of Jesus, and we have somebody that we walk with that already has the victory, so how about we attack it? Like, we let the enemy attack us all the time. Right. And we just be sitting here as victims. He's scared of us. True. We got more power than him. And we yeah. just be falling back. Like, I'm like, no. Can you talk a little bit more on it? Like, just talk, a, elaborate a little bit more on it. 
Because I feel like you're going to just say something good and you just like held yourself back. I just feel like it's not even that I feel like it's the, the truth. The spirit that lives on the inside of us is greater than the spirit in the world. The enemy is a being and he's also a spirit. And he doesn't have any authority or power over us. We literally have power in our tongue, power in our voice, and power in the fact that we are children of God to overcome him. We literally can step on his neck and be like, no, sir, fall down. We have the power to tell the enemy to go back to hell. We just don't exercise it. Right. And I don't know why, because I feel like he's made us have fear or made us be scared that if we come for him, he'll attack us back. But if we go after the enemy, do we really feel like God going to be like, okay, you out there by yourself? No. This is what we called to do. I feel like we wimp. Mm, feel like, oh, wimp, coward. And I, I know the Bible talk about the, the cowardly. Don't be cowards. Like, we can't be cowards, man. <laughs> like, I feel like God calls us his sheep and so we act so fragile and gentile, but we're also called to be warriors. Right. Like, we're also called to be an army like we're also called to be the church that no form of hell or darkness could come against you so why do we be so scared about stuff like we fight in a spiritual war but we got all the tools to win right but oh man you said you said something good why are we so scared of stuff and i feel like we still seeing fear a little bit because people are like man these protests ain't gonna do nothing like the vote the votes ain't gonna do nothing like we should like i'm not even gonna go vote even though you see voter suppression in our communities but that's a whole nother topic but like people like man i'm not seeing no improvement and so they get a little fearful and they like and they run away from the issues we are impatient yeah like how okay this thing what what was the that boycott um the bus boycott. I can't. I don't know the official name. The Montgomery that boy. For like, the, uh, yeah. Yeah. That lasted for like over a year, right? They mm-hmm. did that for a year plus. Yeah. We be out here protesting for a month or two months, and we be like, "I ain't change. We done." Yeah. Like come, like we just got to grow up. That's right. what it is. Because this we like the first home. mass movement. I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry. My fault. Would you say no, like this? Like the first mass movement of our generation. I know we've been battling for 400 years, 400 plus years, but that was our ancestors. But like in our generation, like this is the first mass movement. Like people just got sick because you see the whole world doing it. I know people have been protesting, but like the whole world, like I, you've never seen this before. You, This is literally history and the momentum cannot stop. Like while we got, while we have their attention, we got to keep going. And even when you don't have the attention, we supposed to keep knocking. Like y'all thought we was done? No, because think about it: the majority race pushes what they want on us all the time. It's in commercials, it's in the media, it's in the news. Do they ever let up? No. So why do we have? Why do we let up? Right, we let up. Oh, oh my goodness, that good. Yeah, we do let up. A couple weeks in, we be like, oh, that ain't gonna work out. These folks protesting for no reason. Just go home. We protesting for no reason. It ain't no point in us voting. Yes, it is. Yeah, I think all yes. those things can. Yeah, I think all those. Man, that's so important. Like these protests are important, especially I feel like in Mississippi, and because it's just real important in Little Mississippi. Let me tell you what's gonna happen. Mississippi is about to continue to take a stand against racial injustice and uh, oppression. And we're about to take a stand for racial reconciliation. And Tate Reeves is not going to have a choice but to make action. Right. Because we going to get on his nerves so bad that it's best for him to make a move. Just like when it was time to remove the Confederate flag, all them folks protested against it. And so he didn't make a move. Now you got people protesting that you need to make a move. So you don't have a choice but to. When I tell you, I know for myself and the team that I'm working with, like, we knocking on his door like, oh, you thought we were gone? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. We back. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm glad that they taking down these flags, the all these different leads taking down the Confederate flag. And they, I'm so glad people turn down these statues of these slave owners, like, in front of buildings with exactly. the Confederate flag around them. Like, this what, this what we built on and this what we glorify in America. You know, racism. Literally. That's the right word, glorify. Like we glorify people, racism. People get fire hot when you try to come against what they glorify. 
Right. But that's what we get. That's what you got to do. Like you said, attack the enemy because that's the enemy right there, man. That's that devil right there. That racism. Because you see, I mean, they're making statues literally like, come on now. Like statues. Because I always just see these statues be like, man, why do they have these statues up? Like, what did he really do? Christopher Columbus, you got a statue of what did he? Come on. And even though we know he didn't find, he didn't see all oh, the school system so messed up. They teach us so wrong that he found America. Stuff even like that. when we was in school, though, even when we was in school, though, in my mind, I'm like, wait, so he, how he founded a new country when there was already people there? Right. It's like going into a church with people there, like, oh, I found this church, y'all. Come on. This is my church. Come on, all my people. Let's bring all our diseases and all the types of them. Right, and take them out their church. Uh, now it's mine. You know what? Exactly. I'm gonna have a statue for him. That's what this we got America need to we gotta break that cycle, man. <laughs> Cause it's because if we don't, it's gonna get worse. It's gonna really get worse. It is. But you know what? It's like, of course, we coming from the Christian standpoint. It is definitely gonna get worse. It's gonna get worse before it gets better. And when I say before it gets better, better is when Jesus comes back. Right. Better is us in glory in heaven with God. Right. So we are going to see more persecution. We are going to see more things coming against not just black people, but the church as a whole. But again, this is like training. I feel like God is training us. Right. Like, okay, I need y'all to stand up and step up. Are y'all going to be wimps? Y'all going to let the enemy take over y'all or y'all going to fight for the kingdom? Like, this is why we can't be quiet. Oh yeah, we definitely can't be quiet right now. That's the it's the wrong time to be quiet. Like you said earlier, everything had to come to an end, to a hold. And exactly. like uh it was like a full like a I don't know if it was the, a a divine shift or whatever. Like mm-hmm. I hate to say this like this happened at like at the right time, which is sad. Well, I mean, you don't want yeah. nobody to get get lynched in the middle of the street. But like right. just imagine this happened last year like Come on, I don't think we would have saw what we see today. Like, we literally have to look at all these signs. COVID-19, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Amaya Aubrey. And then we got all this other stuff going on in the world. So everything is just like in our face, hitting us back to back. Like, if we choose not to pay attention to the signs, then we're just ignorant. Right, we just ignorant. Like, have you been... I know we coming from this perspective, this um, Christian perspective, and a lot of people don't like that for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why, and I really don't care that they don't like it. Because, <laughs> you know, it can only be, uh, my thing is, it can only be one truth. So, hey, you know, I, I, we, got, we got the truth. And so, but people be like, man, Christians, y'all don't got no say-so. Have you, have you heard this? Has anybody okay. said this to you? Like, Christians, y'all don't have no say-so in this, like... Y'all got the white man's religion, even though we know this is not a white man's religion. Is yeah. but have you have you seen that during this time? I I have seen some posts, and when I see stuff like this, like in order for me to protect my spirit and my peace of mind, I just got to keep scrolling. Mm-hmm. I can't get into stuff like that. I feel like stuff like that is like bait. I think it's bait too. Yeah, I feel like it's bait because you every decision. I told somebody this other day. Every decision decision that you make comes with seeds being planted in your heart. So if you choose to entertain stuff like that and you choose to go through the comments, try to understand what people are saying like that, that seed is going to be planted in your mind, and then it could just grow into something else that could just snatch you and distract you from what God is trying to do. Mm. So I don't entertain stuff like this. Right. I ain't gonna lie, I do be entertaining stuff like that sometimes. I'll be scrolling through the comments, I'll be reading what people are saying, but I don't never, I don't reply because I don't feel like typing no long message. Sometimes I'll be wondering, like, how do y'all type these messages so quick? Sometimes I think, like, do y'all have this? Do have right, do you have this in your notes? You just copy and paste it and put it in there? Like, but I ain't even seeing that that much this time. I usually see a lot of it. Like, yeah, man, y'all, yeah. man, y'all better shut up. I just, I just see that a lot, but. I don't see it that much now. I guess because everybody yeah. coming together, it, it might be a good thing. I think it is. Um, like how I was telling you, we're trying to plan this event right now. I really feel like this is a time of revival. 
like a time of revival and refreshing, like refreshing, refreshing, because um, we can't be how we how we are right now is not it. Mm-hmm. Like our mindset, our heart, our motives behind why we do stuff, how the church ends up looking just like the world in a lot of ways. Like there is no holiness about us. So I feel like this is a time for the church to take a stand. Like, I don't know why people in the church feel like we're inferior, so we're not. All right. We were never called to be inferior. Um, if there ever was any type of group that was meant to be superior, it's the church. And not superior in a way of, oh, get away from this. Ugh, no, superior in making a change. Superior in being humble. Superior in advocating for voices that can't advocate for themselves superior and showing the world what a light is and how it, what it means to be holy. we be superior in all the wrong ways. we be superior in judging people, superior in casting people out, superior in turning other people away from the church. Like our motive as the church is just not right right now. Oh, so, so true. I mean, you nailed it right in the coffin right there. Like we do got to change our motives and our hearts from what we really try to do. Oh man, cuz you know a lot of I mean you got even got even got disagreements um but you know I ain't got no problem with nobody disagreeing. I don't feel like Christians should, should disagree on I mean agree on every single thing besides the essential issues, but I feel like right. justice is an essential issue, but you got people saying that man this I mean what about this and that? What about what's going on in Africa? What about that? Y'all ain't speak up about that. Y'all don't speak up when a black man gets shot. In, in y'all neighborhood because i mean you don't really have to speak up when a black man gets shot in your neighborhood because i mean a dude gonna go to jail i mean like I mean, he go that's the problem i think people don't understand like people shoot people and go home that's why people mad they already mad because somebody got murdered Fact. and another thing when people say stuff like that again it's ignorance because guess what every racial group kill people inside of their racial group right okay come on White people kill white people. Black people kill black people. Asian people kill Asian people. But we can get if a black man was to kill a white man, there would be no trial. There would be no right. figure out if he's guilty or not. Mm-hmm. That's why we're upset. Right. And so when people choose not to see that, they ignorant. Like, uh, let's just call it what it is. Right. And I, man, yeah, that's why I saw DeAndre Hopkins who played, I forgot, I think he played for the Texans. He said, like, he wore number 10 because his, when his friends got pulled over, he had marijuana and got 10 years in prison like for marijuana. And that's what that's why we are mad. That's why people are mad because injustice is happening for stuff like marijuana. But then you got to say that you need more evidence to come out after you already got got the video. That was it blows my mind and it just feel like it makes it so hard. It makes it extremely difficult to get things done. Even when you got video. Imagine if you didn't have the video. We wouldn't have a chance, really. Exactly. And, like, you see it all the time with the judicial system. The the man that came in and did the autopsy, the one that the state hired. <laughs> bold face lie. Just bold face lie that it was secondary health issues that was the reason that he de- died. <laughs> when they hired somebody to do it privately, they saw that he died from suffocation, right? Right. So, what? where's the difference? Don't Ain't both of y'all professionals in doing autopsies and stuff? So why is this one different than this one? This one is funded by the state, the government. This one is paid for privately. Mm. So you see you see the discrepancies. It's just it's too much. Right. It's too much to oh my goodness, too much really for the mind. And that's why we need that's why we need Christ in times like this. So Exactly. That's why I, that's why I like I always just go back to we have the answer. Like, we got the answer. Are we going to move with this answer? That's just the main question. Are we going to really move with this answer? Or are we just going to forget about this two weeks from now? Exactly. We always be praying to God, like, God, do this. God, help us do this. And he's like, I literally place everything you need in your hands. You're just holding it and wasting time with it. Right. But we do see unity now up in the, up in the black community a little bit. You know, black-owned businesses going viral, people trying to help out each other. And I feel like we always try to help black businesses in general. If we got the opportunity to do it, I, most of the time I see people do it when they got the opportunity to do it. Mm-hmm. And so are we going to stop? I haven't seen that many, that many, that much fussing between, between us. 
in the past <laughs> almost a month. And it's kind of good. I hope it, I hope it lasts, though. Yeah, I feel like our skin color actually brings us together. And, of course, you hear people say black-on-black crime, we're killing each other, gangs against gangs, and all that type of stuff. But because we are, as a group, are being oppressed, when we see each other, it's like, I'm going to make sure I protect you because I know you're trying to make sure I'm protected as well. Right. Because at the end of the day, we feel like we don't got nobody else on our side, so we got to have each other back. Right, and that's what I'm seeing now. Like people got each other back. Like I think, like they got big old, they got big groups, um, Facebook groups, and all type of different groups. Like millions of black people, black owned businesses. I mean, I'm kind of excited right now. I mean, it's kind of tragic that it takes something like this for us to come together more. Exactly. But, uh, but that's, that's what I hate. It took for Jesus to die for people to want to join the church. Woo! That's a word. It took Jesus to die for. Peter to really be saved for his brother James to believe that he was who he said he was. And so sometimes it does take something tragic to happen for us to really be protected or saved. Oh, and that's the gospel. Like it took something tragic like to happen. Like, come on, like a sinful, a, un, a man that's not sinful at, at all going to the cross and dying for you, even though you may hate him. I mean, wow. And so, yeah, exactly. that, that is basically the gospel. So you got any last words you want to say, like any words of encouragement or whatever you may have on your mind? You can just let it out. Um, if it's 20, 30, 80 minutes, I don't care. You can just let it out. Um, it's just, I just want to encourage, first, my encouragement would be to people that aren't just Christians. Like, if you're not a Christian, if you believe in anything else, like, I just want everyone in this day and age to be in Powered. Like, I want people to know that their voice matters, that they matter, that they are worthy, that they are beautiful, they're handsome, that their opinions matter, that they count, that they aren't worthless, that they aren't less than anybody else. Like, whoever you are, whoever may be listening, you matter. And if ain't nobody else told you that, I'm telling you that today that you matter. And as far as my brothers and sisters in Christ, like, this is a wake up call. Like, I feel like we've all just been in a slumber. We've been lazy with our faith. We've been lazy in our relationship with Jesus. We haven't been opening our word. We haven't been praying. We haven't been fasting. We haven't been seeking righteousness or holiness. And so it's like a slap in the face to God because we know the standard of Jesus and we're not. We're not even close to it. So I just want to encourage us to be obedient because if you don't take a stand for God, then you've taken a stand for the enemy. Really. And I'm going to say it again. If you don't take a stand for God, you're taking a stand for the enemy. Like, who do you want to glorify? You want to glorify darkness or you want to glorify the light? The Bible says that those that are not righteous, they don't want to come near the light because it will expose them. But those that are, are righteous, they want to come near the light because they want everybody to see that they're living for Jesus and how he's affecting their life. Like, I want to come near the light. If that means that something nasty or ugly about me has to be exposed, then so be it. Like, we have to get to the point where we're okay with losing what's valuable to us so we can bear our cross every day. So, um, just my brothers and sisters in Christ, wake up. Stop letting the enemy use you. Whoop. And that's Bria Williams, man. Thank you, Bria, <laughs> for taking your time out. I mean, I know you do a lot of stuff. YouTube, blog posts, all, I mean, protests, even studying in school right now i mean i mean you extremely busy so i thank you for taking time out to come on a daily thinker man so i hope y'all after i'm just so glad i'm just so glad this was this blessed me it convicted me and i feel like it helped me especially when yeah, you said I'm about excited. fast yeah i'm excited that you invited me i feel like what you're doing is an is amazing and it again is another opportunity for god to be glorified you know so like what you're doing right now is kingdom work and I feel like this is what we all should be doing. So I'm, I was just excited to be on here. Thank you. So that's Bria William, folks. So y'all make sure y'all go follow. I'm gonna put an Instagram or YouTube her blog post in the in the, the description, and I'm gonna have it on the screen right here too, so y'all can just see and go check her out. I promise you will not regret it. Okay, you won't you won't be mad. You won't be mad at all. You are gonna really be excited. <laughs> I know you was excited to listen to this episode anyway, so. Until then, Daily Thinker, just keep thinking, keep questioning, and most of all, keep trusting Christ Jesus. And we are out. Thank you, Bria, again. Thank you. Thank you so much again. And I'll talk to you later, okay? All right.